Hi every nation, Singapore. We are in the third week of May and we are in the middle of our series on encountering Jesus. And in our time of praying together, let's pray along this couple of verses in Psalm 63 to prepare us even to encounter Jesus even in a greater measure. Psalm 63 verse 1 says this, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Earnestly, soul thirsting, my flesh faints. It speaks of the posture of just being desperate for God. And as we begin our time of praying, are you desperate? Are you desperate to encounter Jesus? This is the psalmist saying, I am desperate for you. Verse 2 says this, So I've looked upon you in the century, beholding your power and your glory. Look upon you, beholding, that means there's a focus on what? On God's power and God's glory. Be desperate for God as we begin our time praying together, but also acknowledge that God is able. He's able to come and give you a breakthrough in your situation, whatever it may be. Desperate for God, acknowledge that He is able. Verse 3 goes on to say, Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. Well, how do we know about God's steadfast love? I guess also it's simply to take this, take time to pause and think of the things that God has done, already done in your life. And that is to remember God's faithfulness. If He has done it before, He can do it again. The situation, the scenario may differ, but God has done it before, He can do it again for you. Remember His steadfast, uh, remember His faithfulness. In verse 4, he ends by saying, So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. What is this showing? It speaks of a response in extravagant worship. So let's begin our time of praying together. One, the posture of saying, I'm desperate for you, Lord. I'm desperate for you. There's a situation. There's something that's taking place in my life. I am desperate for you. But I acknowledge that God, that you are able and I remember your faithfulness. If you've done it before, you can certainly do it again. And my response now is to worship you with all of my heart, my mind, soul, and strength. Extravagant worship. And so Lord, even as we begin our service today, we come before you. Our soul thirsts. We hunger for you. We are desperate for you. We are desperate for you. We are desperate for you, Lord. And Lord, we acknowledge that you are the almighty, the all-powerful God. You are able. You are able to move the mountains. You are able to turn situations around. Just like that, you are able. And Lord, we remember the many, many, many times that you have been faithful. You've done it before. You can do it again. And our one response, even for today, is simply just to worship you with all of our heart, mind, soul and strength. In Jesus' name, Amen. Remembering your 
just to encourage us just to continue with your worship and worship is our entire life and entire being and one facet of worship is really our giving our tithe and offering and continue just to be faithful to be diligent to do that because God is a faithful God where you can give online just get onto our site the details can be found there now I'm going to hand over the time to Pastor Joshua Harris for the time of meditation upon the word of God Hi, everybody. Pastor Josh here again as Pastor Joey continues his time in the Philippines, ministering there and also spending time with family. Us together here on our Meditate Time are going to continue as well. We're going to continue in encountering Jesus, looking at encounters with Jesus, how they might inform encounters we can have with Jesus. For me, this is the whole point of being called a Christian or a follower of Jesus is really that relationship with him. And now we want to talk about how we encounter Jesus in our pain, in our problems, in our challenges. Uh, And to kind of kick us off, we're going to jump back into the book of Matthew and talk about a story from a guy that's that's pretty well known, and he's well known for his problem. Uh, It was saying that as uh, they came to Jericho, and he was leaving Jericho, Jesus, uh, with his disciples, a great crowd, uh, and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. So here's Bartimaeus, and he's kind of known, in fact, when I was a kid, we would go to kids' church and you would hear about blind Bartimaeus. It was like it's his title. He was very much defined by his problem. His problem is very obvious. And at that time in history, uh, blindness was not something easily overcome. You didn't have some of the resources, Braille, other things we have now, where um, what we used to refer to maybe as a handicap or a disease or a problem uh, uh, in, in the old days, in, in today's time, we see many people who, who do experience blindness, yet they can have very fulfilling careers, very fulfilling lifestyles. At the time, Bartimaeus is left as a beggar. There's really not much he can do based on the resources around him. So his problem is actually multiplying into new problems. And so as he hears about Jesus coming, he begins to cry out to him. And he says, have mercy on me. And I love this because he's not hiding his issue. Uh, and it's funny because you might say, well, this is an issue that's very obvious. He has no choice but to show it. But it, it gave me a flashback of a particular movie where a famous black knight gets in a fight. And as this black knight is fighting, he gets his arm cut off. 
literally his arms cut off. The, the sword is on the ground. The arm is on the ground. And the guy says, I have beaten you. And the guy and the black knight tries to keep fighting. And the guy says, I've cut your arm off. And he goes, it's just a flesh wound. Uh, it's a ridiculous, silly, farcical movie. Uh, but sometimes we actually do that. We have obvious, overt, dangerous even problems in our life. Maybe we have uncontrollable tempers. Uh, maybe we have um, disease. You know, I, I have friends who have lost family members to lung cancer who were chain smokers for years. In some cases, doctors who were chain sm- who knew how dangerous this choice was, yet they continued in it. And if you would bring it up, this was kind of the reaction. Oh, it's just a flesh wound. It's no big deal. Well, it could be a big deal. I love what blind Bartimaeus does. He makes the choice to just be honest and say, I've got an issue. Now, it's very interesting what happens next. He's crying out to God. He keeps coming to Jesus. He keeps begging for help. And the reaction of the people is honestly the reaction I give sometimes. Hey, man, can you just calm down a little bit? Hey, be silent, right? Like, okay, you're yelling. I hear you. I hear you crying out to God. But, man, come on, calm down. It's, can, you, can you kind of be cooler? Can you not make a scene? And his reaction is to cry out all the more. How desperate are we for the touch of God? In blind Bartimaeus' case, right, he, he's got an identifier as being blind. He's so desperate. He's willing. It doesn't matter how many times you rebuke me. It doesn't matter how many times you tell me I'm not doing it right or saying it right or, or, or communicating it the right way. I'm going to keep going after Jesus. I'm going to keep crying out for what Jesus is doing. I'm going to keep crying out that God touch me, heal me, uh, give me life, deal with whatever issue there might be in my life that I need saving from. Have mercy on me. And it's amazing. Jesus suddenly stops. Now, did Jesus not know what was going on before and just now calls him? I don't think so. He's God. He knows what's going on around him. Yet somehow this continually crying out spoke to the heart of Jesus, maybe even showed something to the people around them. Keep crying out. Keep believing. Keep pressing in. And here's what happens. It's funny to me. They called the blind man saying, take heart. Get up. He is calling you. The same people, the many who were rebuking him, are now the ones calling him and saying, hey, good news. God's blessing you. God's moving in your life. God's going to heal you. God's going to do a miracle. And I've found this to actually be true in our lives. Sometimes the very people who are rebuking us one minute are the people encouraging us to take heart, get up, and run after Jesus the next minute. It's why it's so important for our hearts to remain pure before the Lord. In Bartimaeus' case, I think his desperation drove him to a point, I don't care if you rebuke me or don't rebuke me. I don't care if you yell at me or you encourage me. I'm going to keep calling to Jesus. And now he gets the word. He's calling to you. So what does he do? Throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Now, a lot's been made about the idea of him throwing off his cloak, because practically speaking, imagine you're blind. Throwing away your cloak, you don't know where it is anymore. There was such a conviction and commitment. I'm going to throw off anything that hinders me. I'm going to throw away anything that's preventing me from running to Jesus. I'm going to tear down any distraction, hindrance, wall, and I'm going to go. And he came to Jesus. What happens when you come to Jesus? Jesus asked him a very simple, what do you want me to do? I'm right here. I'm willing and I'm able to answer. Rabbi, let me recover my sight. He asked him very directly, hey, this is my issue. I'm not hiding it from you, Lord. I'm not pretending. I'm not justifying. I'm not saying it's so-and-so's fault or that person or my parents or somebody else. I'm saying, heal me. Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately, it's one of Mark's favorite words and Pastor Mark's as well, immediately happens right now. He recovered his sight and followed him on the way. So what do we do in our problems? When Jesus enters our heart, enters our life, speaks to our soul in the middle of our problems, we just cry out to him. And can I encourage you, keep crying out to him. When he speaks, run to him. Run to him. Don't let anything hold you back from coming again and again. You know, sometimes uh, we've been talking about this in some of our meetings, you know, that you've been a Christian longer. You start kind of trying to not be an embarrassing Christian, or you do it the right way, I think there's moments where we just got to run to Jesus. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter what people think about us. It matters, are we connecting to Jesus? And then ultimately receiving from him the very blessing he promised. Now later uh, uh, on, or actually earlier in Mark, excuse me, uh, there's this another story where Jesus is going to heal people and he's going through, and there's the problem is there's this giant crowd And they're following and thronged, what an interesting word, thronged about him. So he's trying to make his way through this big crowd. And there was a woman there who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. What does that mean? She is ceremonially unclean. She's weak. 
She's injured. She's hurt. She's continuing to suffer. And, and that makes her unclean, which actually means she's supposed to separate herself from everybody else. It, it makes her an outcast in society. And she had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all she had. She's broke now. She's, got, she's spent all her money trying to get healed. She's spent all her dignity trying to get healed. And now she's not even getting better. She's actually getting worse. She's no better for having spent time, embarrassment, energy, uh, money, everything she has, and it's not getting any better. And she heard the reports about Jesus. You know, I wasn't planning to share this, but just as I see those words again, are we sharing reports about Jesus? Are we still telling stories? Are we still proclaiming who Jesus is, what Jesus is doing, how Jesus is helping our lives, how he's blessing us, how he's um, strengthening us, how he's encouraging us in the midst of challenges? Is that the God word? And are people hearing our reports about him? Well, she heard reports, and so she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Now, that's dangerous. For her to even go into the crowd as an unclean person, that's technically breaking the law. So theoretically, she could be stoned to death for having entered into this crowd. She's literally risking now her life to go for Jesus because she's thinking, if I just even touch his garment, I'll be made well. Look at that faith. If we can just get one touch from Jesus, our lives can change forever. As she touched him immediately, again, that word immediately, what a beautiful word. You know, it doesn't always happen immediately for some things. It's just true. I don't know why. I don't have all the answers to that. We talked about that a little bit last week. God has power to heal. Why doesn't he always heal? Or why doesn't he always heal immediately? I don't always know the answer to that, but I know our responsibility is to believe, to go, to run, to touch, to cry out so we can hopefully hear him and hear his word and hear his commands and obey them. Well, she just goes, she touches and her body was cleaned and healed of her disease. Now, it's interesting, the response of Jesus. He says, the power, he perceives the power goes out from him. So now another immediately, immediately he turns, who touched my garments? The disciples are like, man, there's people all over the place. We're getting smashed. Can you imagine you're going through like the MRT in the middle of like the, 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 the heat of, the, of, of rush hour traffic? And it's like, man, of course people are bumping you and touching you. You can't hardly help it. There's too many people around, especially before COVID, right? It was worse. But now kind of people try to give you your space. You can just cough a little bit and get free space. But anyway, uh, who touched me? How can you say that? And he looked around all the more because he knows someone touched him in a way that's powerful. Now, why is Jesus even doing this? We're going to find out in just a second. He could have just kept going. She's already healed. He makes a point of stopping and finding her. The woman, knowing what had happened, came in fear and trembling. Is Jesus really trying to get her to be fearful and trembling? No, he's trying to do something so much greater. She fell down before him and told him the whole truth. So now she's confessing the entire journey she just took. She's not hiding it. Now, she could hide it. Her, her disease, her illness, her sickness was one she could have hidden away and just hidden it until she died. And, you know, sometimes we do that. We're suffering with something. We're, we're fighting with something. But because it's hidden, we can look good on the surface. We can just keep smiling and acting like everything's okay while internally we're wasting away while we're dying. She didn't do that. She ran to Jesus, and now she's confessing the whole truth. Jesus' response. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed of your disease. I see several things Jesus is doing right here. First and foremost, he's reaffirming her identity. Daughter, hey, you're a child of God. You've been told you're unclean. You've been told you're wasted away. You've been told to separate yourself, not worthy to be part of the family, not worthy to be part of the community. Child of God, daughter, family, your faith has made you well. Be healed. You're healthy now. Your disease is healed, but not just that. Go in peace. Go in wholeness. Shalom, peace, fullness, nothing missing, nothing broken, complete wellness. Be restored. In our problem, we cry out to Jesus. We run to Jesus. We receive from Jesus. He can ease our discomfort. He can heal our disease. He did it to her. And not only that, he restores her dignity, restores her identity, restores her calling. So how should we respond when Jesus does all this for us? You go, I, I did cry out to God. And man, this is my story. I was used to be like this. And now I'm like this. I was just talking to a guy a couple of days ago and he was sharing his story of living in a particular lifestyle and feeling oppressed by that, feeling um, guilty about choices he was making, 
feeling uh, embarrassed and feeling separated even from his friends. And then Jesus touched him and, and the sense that God loves me and, and forgives me and respects me and heals me. And, and he was just weeping with joy for how God had changed his life. Well, how do we respond when God's done so many great things for us? It's a beautiful story here. And as we were talking as a team, uh, Vicky mentioned the story uh, that I'm going to share in just a second with you. But I think this frames it as we kind of wrap up Bartimaeus and enter into the last story I'm going to share before our time of worshiping and proclaiming Jesus in communion together. Uh, Bartimaeus' story ends with Jesus, and I've shared this verse before. Go your way, your faith has made you well. So Jesus tells him, go your way, right? Immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Bartimaeus is offered by Jesus the opportunity, hey, go do whatever you want to do. Bartimaeus' reaction is, okay, my new way, my way, go your way. My way is to follow your way. That's where I'm going now. And that's God's call in our lives. Now, here's the story that to me uh, typifies this or describes it or pictures what that might look like. It says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. So he comes to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner. How would you like that? That's your like descriptor of you. Who, who, what that, what's that woman like? Oh, she's a sinner. Uh, pretty, pretty embarrassing. Pretty shame giving. Uh, and it says, when she learned he was reclining at the table at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment. It's an expensive ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. Can you imagine? She's crying on his feet and cleaning them with her hair, kissed his feet, and anointed them with the expensive ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, he didn't say it to Jesus. And how often are these kind of thoughts the things that revealed in our hearts? He says, if this man were a prophet, he'd know, uh, he would have known who and what sort of woman that is who's touching him. She is a sinner. Uh, there's a lot to be said about that. It's easy to point out other people's sin. The question might be to this guy back, are you a sinner? What is sin? It's missing the mark. It's lack of perfection. It's not fully loving God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's not fully loving my neighbor as myself. I think all of us have fallen short of that, if we can be honest. And Jesus answered him and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, okay, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. He owed one, 500 denarii. That's a lot of money. That's a lifetime of wages. The other owed him 50. Now, when neither could pay, he canceled the debt of both. Which one do you think would love him more? Now, Simon's not a dumb guy. He says, the one I suppose whom he had canceled the larger debt for. And I love Jesus' response. Yeah, you've judged rightly. Here's the truth. He turns to the woman and says, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. That's basic service of being welcomed into someone's house. She's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. She served above, beyond, completely through the roof of what it looks like to serve and humble yourself and honor someone else. You gave me no kiss, no kiss of friendship, no kiss of honor. But from the time I've come in, she hasn't ceased to kiss, not my cheek, my feet. She has not ceased to honor me, to show reverence. Ultimately, you didn't anoint my head with oil. You're supposed to clean me up, make me feel good, make me feel that honor, sense of, sense of um, uh, value. She has anointed my feet with it. She's actually worshiping. She's showing value to the extent of pouring out her best for me, true worship. That's our response to God. When we've really seen him restore our dignity, we've really seen him heal our diseases, we've really seen him ease our discomfort, when we've really run to him, cried out to him, consistently come to him, and seen God move. Now, some of the things in my life I'm still battling with, some of the challenges I face are still challenges. But I can look at this journey and say, there are many things God's healed. There's many things God set me free from. There's many good things God's done for me. And so my response can be her response, to continue to serve him, to serve him with my best, with my all, serve humbly, honor, uh, and even worship him with all my I am. Give all, give my best, pour it out for him. Now here's his response to her response. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much but he who is forgiven little loves little. You know, sometimes we just need to remember how much we've been forgiven from. For many, we think, oh, we're, I'm good. I'm basically a good person. If you think that, sometimes it's hard to love Jesus. Maybe it's because we haven't realized how much he's actually forgiven, how much he's actually healed, how much he's actually cleansed. 
often that religious attitude of I'm better than others, which is sickening. God says he hates pride. He hates, a, uh, in Proverbs, it says a haughty look looking down at others as, as if I'm superior to them. He hates it. It's a sin to him. It's a dirty, wretched sin. Whatever sin you're thinking of that's, oh, those are the bad sins. He sees pride as one of those. But what he recognizes is this. If you don't realize how much I've forgiven you, you're going to love little. For her, she recognizes she's forgiven a lot, so she loves a lot. And then he says to her, your sins are forgiven. That's what we celebrate when we come together and proclaim Jesus by taking the bread and taking the cup. Body, his body broken so our bodies could be made whole. His blood shed so that our sins could be forgiven. We've been forgiven much, so we should love much. As we take a time to worship together, I'm just going to invite you in your own pace and at your own time to, to take bread, to take some kind of cup, to, maybe with your family if they're there. If you're alone, you can do that before the Lord uh, during our time of worship. And just remember, your sins are forgiven. If we're willing to say, Jesus, you're Lord. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my worship. I give you my service. I give you my honor in the way that this woman did. The promise from Jesus, your sins are forgiven. So Lord, I thank you that you forgive our sins. You heal our diseases and you set us free. I pray now as we worship and we take the bread and cup together um, virtually over different areas, wherever someone might be, that in that moment, your healing is still present. Your, your power is still present. Your forgiveness is still present, and we receive it now in your name. Amen. Lord, we run to you and Lord, I pray that we will never hide from anything from you and even as we got encouraged uh, today uh, just to be 
real and just to go to you and go to you and just be open with whatever issues we are facing and when we go to you Lord we know we know and we know that you are there for us that you will bring healing you bring breakthroughs you bring strengthening in our lives and ultimately the greatest victory is the forgiveness of our sins and so Father Lord Jesus we give you thanks we praise you in Jesus name Amen Well God bless you have a great week ahead Lift you up